Everybody, there it is. Um, it we, just it just happened. Uh, there so. you have it. I know. All right. Well, with that, with that, John, um, can you? set up the slides and I'm going to introduce our speaker for tonight. Welcome to At Nourish. Um, you know, there are times when we have really timely topics and uh, tonight I think is one of them. I am really thrilled uh, to introduce Dr. Andrew Wallach. As you can see on the slide, he's the Chief Medical Officer, um, Ambulatory Care, New York City Test and Trace Corps. And I think that's going to be an interesting piece of the discussion, isn't it, Andrew? He's also an Associate Professor of Medicine at NYU. Um, he is the clinic, I could just go on, he's the Clinical Director of Ambulatory Care, New NYC Health and Hospitals at Bellevue. And um, he's the Associate Director, Clinical Innovations and Clinical Affairs Associate Professor of Medicine, Division of General Internal Medicine and Clinical Innovation, NYU Grossman School of Medicine. Andrew, I imagine during these COVID times, every one of those titles is absolutely necessary. Yes. So uh, with that, um, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. I'm gonna ask you to put your questions in the chat. I will monitor the chat for Andrew and I'm gonna let Andrew take over and not spend any more time chatting. Andrew Wallach, also known as Liza's brother-in-law. <laughs> Thanks, Shirley. And also a shout out, don't wanna forget my brother, Bill. So indeed. So It's happy. true, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> happy to be here tonight uh, with you all. Um, so next slide, please. So tonight I'm gonna to go pretty quickly uh, through my slides so that we have ample time to do question and answer. And if interested, um, I'm more than happy, Shirley and John, to share my slides uh, with folks uh, who would like a copy of it because there is a lot of information on it. Yes, that's great, thank you. The three takeaways that I want you to leave tonight with are the following. Number one, get tested regularly for COVID-19. Number two, new COVID-19 vaccines are effective including against the new variant strains, and we'll talk about that, but they require special handling. And number three, I want everyone to practice the core four, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on. Next slide, please. So this is a picture, uh, an electron micrograph of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the virus that causes uh, COVID-19. And I'm not showing this just because it's a very pretty picture, uh, but I want to kind of red spikes, these triangular shapes, because we're going to talk about that a little bit more. But these are the protein spikes that are going to be so important for our discussion on vaccines. Next slide. So this is just a reminder that there is a class of viruses called coronaviruses. Currently, there are seven different variants that affect humans. The ones on the left with their fancy names are all relatively benign. The ones on the right, however, are the ones that really cause disease. And some of these may be familiar to you from several years ago. SARS, um, MERS, which is Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. And then interestingly, this is an old slide, but WPS actually stands for Wuhan Pulmonary Syndrome, which was the original name for what we're now calling COVID-19. So just to let you know, this is part of a class of known viruses that we see. Next slide. I wanna give a little bit about epidemiology. If you can go back one slide, please, uh, about the COVID uh, pandemic that we've been experiencing for the past 11 months. And this is a pretty impressive slide. This is New York City data, and it looks at hospitalizations for patients with COVID-19. And the thing that I wanna point out the most is obviously in the springtime, we had our peak. But what you'll notice is that peak did not start until the first or second week of March. And we all know that the virus made its presence in New York City in February. So the takeaway from this is there's a little bit of a lag period from when the virus appears and you test positive until hospitalizations occur. Luckily, over the summertime, as you'll see, we had very low hospitalization rates in New York City. But since December, unfortunately, we're heading in the wrong direction. Next slide. This is a similar slide. Next one, please. Okay, thanks, John. Oops, back one. Yeah, perfect. So this is a similar slide to the other, but this is now showing deaths related 
to the uh, COVID. And what you're going to see on this is that deaths didn't really start until mid um, March. So again, a lag period from the time you're diagnosed till the time, you're and then until uh, you have an adverse uh, or bad outcome as death. And again, this curve, as you will see, is heading in the wrong direction if you look at data starting from December of last year into January now. Next slide. This is a very busy slide, but I wanted to show the progression of the amount of testing that we have done in New York City. The blue line is the average seven day testing that we perform. And I'll point out that in January, on three separate occasions, we tested over 100,000 New Yorkers on a single day for COVID-19. The bottom gray or black line indicates the antigen or rapid test that we perform. So you can see over time, we have significantly increased the number of testing that we have performed in New York City. Next slide. So where are we now? So I pulled up some data and it looks like as of most recently, New Jersey had a positivity rate of 10.9%. New York City has a percent positivity rate of 6.9%. But one of the most important things to point out on this slide is test per 100,000, right? Because you know that if you target testing and you don't test that many people, you're going to have a much higher rate. So look, for example, in New Jersey, you're doing 660 plus tests per 100,000, whereas in New York, we're doing well over 1,000 per 100,000. So very important when you talk about percent positivity to understand what your denominator is. And to be very specific, right now, Idaho is the worst in the country. They have a positivity rate of 42%, but they're doing very little testing. On the other end of the extreme is Vermont, which has a percent positivity rate of 2.5%, but they're doing the same amount of testing or close to for New York. So if somebody wants to go somewhere to be safe, head up to Vermont. Next slide. Okay, so how did New York City keep its percent positivity rate relatively good and prevent all these hospitalizations after our horrible uh, surge back in March and April? In June of this summer, we launched something called the New York City Test and Trace Corps. This is run by the city through New York City Health and Hospitals, and there are three main pillars to our plan. The first is testing. That is the absolute most important thing is we need to be able to identify people who have the infection and then get them into care or get them isolated. So testing by far and away the most important, and I'm not just saying that because I'm leading that particular pillar, although maybe. All right, the next two pillars, however, are equally important. And the second is that of tracing. So after we identify a case, it is really important that we get that individual into isolation and equally that we interview them and understand everybody who they've come into contact with so we can then call them and let them begin quarantine so as not to potentially further spread the virus. The last pillar is take care, and that's providing the resources that folks are effectively able to either isolate or quarantine. And just to put this into perspective, we're currently doing in New York City about 4,000 intakes per day, meaning calling 4,000 people who are recently tested positive, and we're monitoring approximately 20,000 patients a day, meaning we are calling them, making sure they're isolating or that they're quarantining. This is a huge operation, but it's the reason why New York has been so successful to date. The last piece with Take Care is we have now stood up four hotels throughout New York City to provide free housing for individuals who are unable to either isolate or quarantine at home. And we have about 850 people in those hotels as we speak, and we're opening up a fifth hotel next week. Next slide. All right, so this is a very busy slide, and it's just meant to uh, be a placeholder for me to remind us that when we talk about COVID tests, there are three different tests. The first two are what we call diagnostic tests, meaning we're looking to find active infection in an individual. And these are either molecular tests, more commonly known as the PCR test, and also the antigen test, which is more commonly known as a rapid or point of care test. We know that the molecular test is our gold standard. It gives us the best sensitivity and specificity, but it requires processing in a laboratory and that can take several days. In fact, in the early spring, it was taking a week to two weeks to get those results. Right now, our turnaround time in New York City on average is two days. The last type of test, just to be very clear when we talk about COVID, is the antibody or serologic test. This is a test, typically a blood test, 
that is done to look to see if you've been exposed or had the infection. This is not a test that we use for diagnosis. Okay, next slide, please. Andrew? Yes. Before you go off this, yep. um, can you stay with the test? There are two questions about testing that maybe you want to tackle right now if I tell them to you. Sure. All right. So the first one was about the antigen test. Mm -hmm. And the question basically says, if you have, if you have antibodies that tested for antibodies, mm -hmm. do you skip the vaccine for several months? Yeah, so it's a great question. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But okay. I believe right now, there was a recent article in Science uh, that showed that folks who have had the infection, who have tested positive, and certainly who have antibodies, have some type of natural immunity to the infection. And we think that immunity is good for at least 90 days. So the recommendations currently are that you can get vaccinated as soon as your symptoms have resolved from an active infection. But if you want, you are most likely to be safe to wait 90 days and allow others to get vaccinated first because we do have a limited supply. Okay, and the next part, the question is that uh, from, I guess this is Jerry, he said that he understands that New Jersey doesn't report rapid tests while New York does. Does that explain the high positivity rate, um, higher positivity rate in New Jersey? Yeah, so again, it's a really great question and it depends again on how much rapid testing they're doing. The other thing I would point out that rapid testing is not perfect. And so in fact, if you get a negative test on a rapid, you often have to confirm that with another test that goes to a laboratory. And so, so it's a little bit more complicated. Um, and I'm not familiar with New Jersey, but they should be doing the same thing. They still should be recording if they do that confirmation test in a laboratory. And I'll save the third question because it's about which test is best if you want to yep. go travel. So perfect. Great, next slide. And so then here just very quickly, our goals for testing, as I said at the outset, we want everybody to get tested and we want you to get tested on a regular basis, even if you feel well. And the reason for this is that we know that people are contagious up to two days before they develop symptoms. I've had several of my patients who have tested positive and then develop symptoms several days later. So it's really important to catch people early before they infect others. And then most importantly, testing is free in New York City at any of the New York City health and hospital sites. Absolutely free. No copay, no insurance deductible, no out of pocket expense. Next slide. So, how do you find a site? Well, you can look online, you can make a phone call, you can get a text, you can send smoke signals. The bottom line is it's easy to find a location to get tested. At New York City Health and Hospitals, we've also even set up a a website where you can look to see what the wait times are and you can choose your site based on what the current wait is. Similarly, we know that many populations uh, and communities of color were disproportionately affected uh, by the pandemic. We have a lot of undocumented individuals in New York City, so we do not inquire about immigration status. Next slide. This is just a busy slide again to remind myself that we're in a very different place today than we were back in the spring. These are all the different treatments that are available for patients who test positive for COVID-19. And this alone should be a very motivating for individuals to want to get tested, get tested frequently so that if they do test positive, we can start to treat them early, get them to have better outcomes, and equally important, prevent further spread of the disease. Next slide. Okay, so this is why I think people came out to talk tonight. Uh, so I wanted to spend a little bit of time uh, about um, vaccines, because that's all the rage um, and very important, obviously, to getting us out of this mess. So before I go into the specific kind of COVID vaccines, I wanted to take a step back and give what I call a vaccines 101. So just for all of us for level setting, traditionally for vaccines, we used a weakened form of a virus or a vaccine to inject into people, right, in order to create an immune response. And in common examples include the measles, the mumps, the rubella vaccine that we've all had, and for many of us, those who've had the pneumococcal vaccine or pneumovax, these are all weakened viruses or bacteria that we inject in order to stimulate an immune response. Now, DNA and RNA vaccines are different and they use part of the virus's own genetic code to actually have the cell do the work for us and produce that protein that will then cause that immune response. So a very different process 
um, than what we have seen historically. And many people say to me, you know, Dr. Wallach, are these vaccines safe? That they came about so quickly within, you know, literally within eight to 10 months. And what I like to remind folks is that we've been doing research on DNA and RNA vaccines for over 10 years. So the platform, if you will, for understanding these vaccines has been well shown. And all we had to do was create that specific messenger RNA code and insert it into this vaccine. And that is the reason why we've been so successful in being able to very quickly pull up these vaccines. Okay, so let's move on to the actual vaccines themselves. Um, next slide. And this is our friend, the SARS-CoV-2 again. And again, I just wanted to point out those red triangular shapes, which are the protein spikes, which is where our vaccines are going to be targeted against. So next slide. So I think everybody's familiar with Operation Warp Speed, right? This is the federal government's uh, endeavor to kind of produce uh, and develop vaccines as well as production uh, of them. And I would just point out, these are the four main uh, candidate vaccines. As you know, Pfizer and Moderna are already out. Um, and Johnson & Johnson is queued up probably for some time in late February. And then Oxford AstraZeneca, of which I'm participating um, in a clinical trial myself, uh, in wearing my academic hat, is probably gonna be coming out later. The points I wanna make is that Pfizer in particular, and the reason why it's highlighted, it's not because it's better, but the reason why it's highlighted is that the federal government funded Pfizer to help with the manufacturing of the actual vaccine and not its development. Whereas with Moderna and the other vaccines, the government is actually helping pay for development. And so with Pfizer, you may have heard that Cuomo, you know, governor of New York state, actually is trying to make a side deal with Pfizer in order to be able to purchase vaccine directly. Right now, Pfizer has committed 100 million doses to the country. Moderna has committed 300 million doses to the country. And the last thing that I'll say about the Johnson & Johnson product that we're looking forward to is that its advantage is that it is heat stable, meaning it doesn't require these cold temperatures for storage, and it has the added benefit of only requiring one shot and you're done. All right, next slide, please. Again, this is a very busy slide talking about operation warp speed. And from my perspective as a clinician, I just wanna say, I think this is great that they spent all this time and energy in figuring out how to get the vaccine from the manufacturers actually to the clinics and the hospitals, but it sure would have been nice had we had a national plan to figure out once it got to those places, who was gonna get it, how they were gonna get it, and when they're gonna get it. Right now, it's up to each of the individual states to decide what they're gonna do with their allocation of virus, excuse me, of vaccine. And I think that's what's leading to a lot of the confusion that we're seeing around the Okay, next slide, please. All right, so the two vaccines that have what we call emergency use authorization from the FDA are the Pfizer and the Moderna products. And I just wanna take a moment to talk about EUA. So emergency authorization is not full licensure like we do with traditional vaccines or traditional medications. It is a special entity set up during disasters and it allows us to bring to market products including vaccine or medication sooner than we would have. The products still go through a rigorous review, but the amount of data that is required to get that uh, authorization is less than it would be for a full licensure. And as of right now, Pfizer and Moderna are in the process of moving towards that full licensure as well. But just very quickly about these particular products, which again, I wanna remind people, these are messenger RNA vaccines the ever had. Pfizer requires that the product be shipped in what we call ultra cold, uh, freezers at minus 70 degrees Celsius. It can be stored up for five days in a regular freezer. And then it comes in five doses uh, per vial. It requires that the team actually reconstitute. It's a dry powder when it thaws and you have to inject saline into it so that you can then administer it to individuals. Moderna is a little bit better. It can be shipped and stored at minus 20 degrees Celsius and it can be stored up to 14 days and it comes in 10 dose vials and does not have to be reconstituted. So from a handling perspective, it's a lot easier to, to do. Most of the Pfizer product is really being administered at hospitals and centers that have those capabilities of the ultra cold freezers. All right, next slide. All right, so what are the contraindications who can't receive the vaccine? So first and foremost, if you've had another vaccine within the last 14 days, you have to wait. If you're currently ill, 
from known COVID infection, or you have a COVID test that's pending, you need to either recover from your illness or get your result back that you're negative before you can be vaccinated. If you're moderately or severely ill at the time of an appointment, just like any other vaccine, we ask you to wait until you recover from your illness. In the past 90 days, if you received monoclonal antibodies or convalescent plasma, this is literally plasma that we take from patients who've recovered and we passively infuse it to kind of help protect individuals. Again, you have to wait those 90 days. And then lastly, if you have a known allergy to any component of the vaccine. Now I will tell you, these vaccines have 10 components and they're very inert. And so the few case reports that we've heard about allergic reactions and anaphylaxis, the most likely culprit is something called PEG or pegulated um, glycol. It is still very unusual to have a reaction to it. And so we're still learning as we go. But these are the known contraindications for taking a vaccine. And everybody who gets one should be screened with these questions beforehand. Next slide, please. All right, as we talked about, the vaccine is being distributed through health departments throughout the country. Obviously, distribution is going to be limited by the special handling requirements, in particular, the, the cold storage requirements. This is something I want to emphasize. Right now, for the Moderna and the Pfizer product, you need two doses. Most importantly, you need to get both of those doses at the same facility. So you can't go to one doctor's uh, facility to get the first dose and say, okay, well, I'm going to be in New York you know, for my second dose. I'm just going to pop in to Bellevue and get my second dose there. It has to be from the same facility. And the reason why that's so important is that that is how the allocation is being submitted. So for every first dose we give, the state will give us a second dose to store so that we have that for the individual. So really important to go to the same place for both. The interval for the second dose for Pfizer is a 20 day window and Moderna it's 28 days. You are allowed, depending on scheduling, to get the shot four days before, before that. So either on day 17 or day 24. And then there is no, um, there's no um, cap of when you can get it. So say for example, on day 28, you get sick, you'll wait until you get better and then you can get your second dose and don't have to restart uh, the series. It is an intramuscular uh, administration, typically in the deltoid, the upper arm, and the products are not interchangeable. So again, if you got the Pfizer dose for your first one, you will get the Pfizer for your second dose. Next slide, please. All right, so there's been a lot in the um, lay media about reactogenicity to the vaccine. And so it's really important to remind folks that before vaccination, they should understand both the local and systemic vaccination symptoms. And unless a person develops a true contraindication to the vaccine, they really should complete the series, meaning get that second injection, even if they've had some symptoms. We, we do recommend that antipyretic or analgesic medications, things like Tylenol or ibuprofen, Advil, can be taken if you have a sore arm or muscle aches or headache after the vaccine. But I'm recommending that we don't take it in advance. Some people say, well, you know what? I wanna prevent that from happening. So before I get my vaccine, I'm gonna go ahead and take Advil. We really recommend that you don't. Um, and the reason why is we really don't want to interfere with the inflammatory response that the body has against the vaccine. In theory, it should be working through separate uh, mechanisms, but nonetheless, unless you really feel like uh, you're in pain afterwards, I would recommend not taking anything. Okay, next slide. This is just a very busy slide to remind us, I think we all know phase 1A, which is really healthcare workers uh, and residents in nursing homes all qualify. Next slide, please. And now we're in phase 1B that started on the 11th of January. Again, these are the New York state phases. And what I would point out to you all is that it is the same in New Jersey with the one exception. And that in phase 1B, New Jersey is also including individuals 65 and older who have comorbidities, meaning chronic disease like hypertension or diabetes uh, or asthma. And interestingly, New Jersey has also included smokers as a comorbidity in order to give it to in 1B. And I know that's a little bit controversial in the medical community. In New York State, we have not agreed at this point to administer a vaccine to those with comorbidities. That for us will likely be in 1C. And the reason for that, quite honestly, even in phases 1A and 1B alone in New York State, approximately 7 million folks qualify or are eligible for the vaccine. So we're talking huge numbers. And so we have to do this in an orderly manner to get vaccine to the most vulnerable. 
Phase 1C, uh, we expect most likely will include other essential workers and in New York, comorbidities, and that probably will happen sometime in March or April. And then phase two, probably later on in the spring, early summer for everybody else. Next slide, please. So how are we doing? So this is a graph, a chart of New York City vaccinations to date. And this is already outdated. I, I did this slide last night, uh, but the latest number from today is that we've completed 403,157 first doses and 52,580 second doses. So as you can see, we have a long ways to go. Next slide. All right, the last thing I wanna mention uh, about vaccine that I know is of interest to folks really is about the variants. And there are two known ones right now. There's the England B117 and the South African strain. And I wanna point out that none of this is a surprise. This is what viruses do, they mutate. So this was certainly expected, but unfortunately these particular strains have had a significant impact. So next slide, please. So this is a map of the US and the dark blue states are essentially states that have identified the B117 or the UK strain. Um, as of most recently, there were approximately 122 known cases throughout the US. Likely there are many, many, many more. It looks like New Jersey has not identified it yet, whereas New York state has, but I'll be honest with you, it's in New Jersey. The issue is we are not doing enough of the genotyping in the US compared to what they're doing overseas. And that's why we're not picking it up. So trust me, it is there. The ominous thing about these strains is that we're working with um, modelers from Columbia and NYU. And what they're modeling out as of this week is that if we do not get 150,000 people a day vaccinated in New York City, by March, we're expecting that the UK strain will be the predominant one in New York City. And that will lead to a third wave. And that third wave of, of infections, they are predicting, and again, this is all just based on calculations, but they are predicting it will be worse than wave one. So the message is we need to get vaccine into arms. Next slide. So I'm just gonna go over these very quickly. We're running out of time and Shirley's gonna yell at me shortly. Um, so I just wanna say um, that these variant uh, strains, they are not any more deadly. They are just more likely for people to get infected. They're more contagious, if you will. Essentially what they do is those spike proteins are more efficient in getting into cells and infecting people. Next slide. And the same thing with the South African strain, which we have not seen so much here, but we thought the UK strain was bad. The South African strain is even more contagious. And in fact, um, in three weeks, the number of cases tripled uh, in London from this. So it is highly, highly contagious. So last slide, please. Next slide. All right, and this is my last slide, Shirley. I, I love this one. Um, and so this to me, from where we are today, I want to end by saying it is imperative that each of us practice what we call the core four. And that's maintaining physical distance of at least six feet. If you're sick, please, please, please stay home. Wash your hands regularly. And gosh darn it, when you leave your house, wear a mask. And so this is really important because it's great that we have vaccines, but as you saw, it's gonna take time in order to get everybody vaccinated. And so we still need to make sure, especially with these more contagious variants circulating, to protect one another. All right, with that, uh, we can move to the next slide and I'll pause and happy to answer or attempt to answer any questions from the, from the group. So let, let me give you a few of them and I'm sure there'll be more. Some of them are very practical. Okay. If people want to travel, you know, what kind of test do you take? What do you, you know, what's the best test to take if you want to get on a plane? Will the rapid test do the trick? What, yeah. what do you do? Yeah, I'll be perfectly honest with folks. From my perspective, the role for the rapid test is very limited. The role for the rapid test is if somebody has symptoms and they're not feeling well, and there's a high suspicion or likelihood that they have COVID. Because if in that scenario they test positive, you're done, you have COVID. However, if you're using the point of care or rapid test for screening, such as travel, if you test negative, we call that a preliminary negative, and you still have to do a confirmation PCR test. So my advice for folks who are traveling is that within 72 hours of leaving, 
you should go and get a PCR test. Most places are having a turnaround time now of less than 72 hours um, to get that result. And you will feel better knowing that you've had the gold standard test and that you are safe. So 72 hours before you leave. That's correct. And then when you arrive, you do another. Yeah, so it depends on the state. In New York State, um, you when you return from an area of high prevalence, which is essentially the whole United States right now, um, unless you're an essential worker, you need to quarantine at home. And they mean real quarantine, not leaving your house for four days. On day four, if you get tested and you're negative, you can end your quarantine. And that's a really important point, Shirley, is that it takes approximately four to seven days for somebody to turn positive on a test. And so therefore, if you had an exposure, let's say today, there's really no utility in you getting tested today. You should really wait until day four and then get your test, because that's when you would likely show that uh, on a screening test. By the way, just as an aside, do you know what the law is on testing? Are tests supposed to be free or around the country or? They, they are. It is provided by the federal government. Now, some uh, urgent care centers do charge what they call an administrative fee, but the actual test itself should be at no cost. Okay, so let's move on from testing. Um, this is really helpful. This is a very specific one, but you were talking about um, illness and, and reactivity. If someone had a disease, this one specifically GBS, Guillain-Barre uh, syndrome, yeah, 20 right. years yeah. ago, yep. 30 years ago, are they eligible to get the RNA test? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so Guillain-Barre uh, is a known um, illness that can be triggered by vaccines. There really has not been any evidence uh, in the clinical trials uh, for either the Moderna or the Pfizer product where folks developed Guillain-Barre. Uh, and again, as a reminder, I think at the Pfizer trial, there were 40,000 folks. And then in the Moderna trial, there were an additional 30,000. And then of course, we've, we've literally uh, vaccinated hundreds of thousands throughout the world since. And so I would say that the risk of getting COVID and having an adverse outcome outweighs the small, small, small theoretical risk of redeveloping Guillain-Barre. And so I would recommend taking the vaccine. All right. So here's a question. You mentioned the new virus being more contagious, the- mm -hmm. the, the strain. Mm -hmm. The strain. Does that mean that it's more virulent, that it's, it's, it's more harmful, or is it just more contagious? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. And again, I want to emphasize that, Shirley. It is just more contagious. It finds its way into cells more readily. It is not more virulent as far as causing worse disease or worse outcomes once you get it. It just means many more people who might have been exposed by other strains with a low exposure may not have developed disease. With this, it takes less virus to become infected. Okay, now I'm going to group a couple because this is for if you've been vaccinated. Okay. One, okay, do you still need to be tested if you think, you know, you've been exposed um, and are vac and this is something that's been in the paper a lot so maybe you can tell us the truth are vaccinated people still contagious yeah great great questions so a takeaway message in general from this is i want to encourage everybody to get vaccinated once they're eligible as soon as you can okay that said we know from the clinical trial that the pfizer product was 95 percent efficacious and the Moderna product was 94%. Pretty darn impressive, but they're not 100%. So even after vaccination, we cannot let up on, again, what I'm going to go back to and call the core four. We still need to be very careful because, yes, even though you've been vaccinated, you can still develop COVID. Often, however, if you do, you'll have a much milder course because your body will be able to respond to it right away because it has antibodies. And equally important, you may not even develop symptoms and, and get infected, and therefore you can spread it to others. So even though you've had the vaccine, you still need to practice those core four. Nothing should change other than the fact that I'm gonna sleep better at night knowing that if I do get infected, I have a much better chance of fighting it off and having a milder course as opposed to not being vaccinated, at least for now. So I'm just gonna repeat what I heard you say. With the vaccine, you can still get the disease Yep. You can be non-symptomatic and you can spread it. So right. wear the stupid mask. You got it. Is that it. what you said? Yes, ma'am. 
And okay. I'll give you a perfect example. In New York State, we had one of our congressmen uh, who received the vaccine early in December uh, and tested positive about a week or so ago. Uh, again, he had a very mild course, but a perfect example that you can still get infected. So now, now I'm going to get into more technical stuff. So I have to do this carefully. Okay. Um, Me too. <laughs> <laughs> because um, now this is this is a question from a doctor. Um, the the measles vaccine prevents the virus. The COVID vaccine just prevents getting sick. Is that true? And what's the difference? Yeah. So what the, the they are actually very similar. So what is going to happen with the COVID vaccine is that your body is going to produce these proteins called antibodies. And we know that antibodies are part of the immune system. When I think of kind of warriors, if you will, in the body that will help fight off any infection. And so often, as you know, if you get the flu, for example, you develop a fever, right? That's your body's reaction trying to fight off the infection. If you've had the vaccine, what will happen is those antibodies, those proteins will attack those COVID viruses as they circulate throughout your body and help neutralize them. So the goal is that if they're effective enough, they will completely neutralize the virus and you won't get sick. But if you do get sick, it'll be at a much lower level. Does that make sense? So it's really, yeah. it, really, it is the same mechanism. It's just that with the COVID vaccine, we're using your body with these messenger RNA vaccines to produce those antibodies against the protein. Whereas with the measles, mumps, and rubella, for example, we're actually injecting that into your body to develop that immune response. And so we have to create those in the lab, grow them in eggs. It's much, much more difficult process. Got it. So this, this can be developed faster in, in that respect. Absolutely. Got it. So here we go. First of all, pregnancy. Um, <laughs> we don't have too many pregnant people here, but I imagine that there are people, grand, <laughs> grandparent type people on this. Um, is pregnancy a counter, uh, counter indication? Yeah, it's a really excellent question, whoever asked that. So right now, uh, the studies did not include women who were pregnant or lactating. Um, and in fact, we are going back currently now um, and doing further trials. Obviously, these are not going to be placebo controlled, but we are going to give vaccine to women who are pregnant and follow them out. I will tell you in looking at organizations uh, like the American College of Gynecology, they are recommending right now that women who are pregnant should be able to get the vaccine. It does appear safe uh, to give, but I can't tell you that 100% because those women were excluded uh, from those initial studies. But the technology behind the mRNA vaccines appear to be safe uh, in those pregnant or breastfeeding. All right, so now here's the big question, Andrew. People want to know, um, are we ever going back to normal? Yeah. What does herd immunity mean? You know, how long will it take to get there? And if I get my vaccinations, you know, can I start to go out? Yeah. And I think yeah. we've said this in different ways, but I think the question keeps coming up. So Yeah, and it, and it does because it's an excellent question, quite honestly. And again, I'll speak from my perspective. And that is, I don't think we are going back to what we're, or what we're gonna call the old normal. I think we're gonna to move to a new normal, quite honestly. Um, and I think there are definitely some benefits uh, that we've seen, but certainly it has been really challenging for most. Um, and that's what's really hard. Um, right now, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how long the actual vaccine will last and give immunity. We're gonna to continue to study this. Is this going to be a vaccine similar to flu where we're gonna to have to give boosters uh, on a periodic basis, whether it be annually or every five years, unknown. And again, because it's not 100%, we need to be careful because we know that people can still get infected and still spread it. So are we going back to normal, quote unquote? I don't think so. I think we're gonna move forward and we're gonna return to some semblance of normalcy. For example, I know you mentioned grandparents. I know they have really been adversely affected in particular older populations of isolation uh, from family and loved ones. Uh, I know personally from family stories of people not being able to see grandchildren, uh, which is really hard. And I think those things will get better because we'll be able to do that safely or more safely. But are we going back to completely normal? I don't see it at least in the next year. Uh, I really don't. Boy, that's an important message because 
people think it's going to be magic in the summer. No. We'll get vaccinated no. and we're going to go to pool parties. No. And, and, and to your point also, I, I, if I may, you mentioned herd immunity, right? And so herd immunity is this concept, right? When enough people in a society or a herd, right, are, are immune to this disease and therefore it's very difficult for that virus to be able to circulate um, and be able to propagate. And so over time, it literally dies out. That's gonna take a fair amount of time. And, and the reason why I say that is that in 2021, we live in a global community, right? I mean, we saw this with this pandemic and how it started you know, in China and literally spread around the world. And I think we're gonna to continue to see that, especially in developing countries uh, where they're not gonna have access to vaccine to the extent that we do, that this will still continue to propagate. And this is probably something we're gonna be dealing with for the next couple of years uh, until we can get it under better control. So to your point, we may have herd immunity here in the US, but that really isn't very meaningful because we constantly have people traveling from all over the world and potentially being carriers um, to further spread. So this is something we'll continue to see uh, over time. And I mean, just want to go back to something you said earlier. With the vaccine, you can still get infected. So there's never any pure immunity. It doesn't go away. Right. 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 Although I have to, that is correct, but I do want to emphasize, not to be a doom a doomsayer, I want to emphasize that 95% efficacy is pretty darn impressive, right? Yeah. So the vaccines are incredibly effective, um, and we're just talking worst case scenario. But for the most part, yes, they're incredibly, incredibly efficacious. So now I want you to put your government hat on, Sweet. not your doctor hat. The question has come up, um, can the can my office require people to get vaccinated yeah. to come back to work? Yeah. And how do you deal with HIPAA um, privacy regulations? What's yeah. the balance there? Uh, such an excellent question. And we've been getting this quite a bit already. Um, and I will use flu actually as an example. Um, so in your uh, lovely introduction to me tonight, Shirley, you mentioned, you know, that I um, hold an academic appointment at NYU. So using flu as the example, NYU probably, I think maybe three or four years ago now, mandated that all employees must get a flu vaccine each year. If you do not get a flu vaccine at NYU, you will be terminated. It is a requirement. And so right now, we are not requiring people get a COVID vaccine. But if I looked into my magical crystal ball, my guess is this conversation and dialogue will continue and I could readily see it becoming a mandate uh, for work and certainly in the healthcare field. And the thing that I wanna emphasize that really blows my mind is that there still is significant vaccine hesitancy among healthcare workers, um, meaning they're not ready to get the vaccine, they wanna wait and see. And that really troubles me uh, because we are putting not only ourselves at risk, but we're putting patients at risk. And so that is the rationale behind the flu vaccine being mandatory at NYU. So from my perspective, I see it as a very natural progression. But right now, the goal is to get as many people vaccinated as we can. And just to stay with this same question about the work environment, I know they're doing this at universities, but I don't know about offices. Can offices require people to test and not return to the office until they have negative results. Does yeah. that violate HIPAA? It doesn't. It depends on the company. And right now, there are companies that have already been doing that throughout the pandemic, where they require their employees who are coming in person to get tested on a regular basis mm -hmm. uh, and then to notify them if they have a positive test. Yeah. Um, and so, again, the HIPAA violation only comes into the fact if you and I are working in a shared office with five other people and I test positive, it's my obligation to tell the employer. They can't say, surely it was Andrew. <laughs> what they can do is say somebody in your group tested positive. Now, if you're in a small group, you're a pretty smart gal, you're gonna figure out it was me. Right. Uh, I can't actively tell you that it was me for HIPAA rules. Yeah, I can. I, I think I, we see that in running our school mm -hmm. where we can't say who tested positively, right. but if somebody tested positive, we have to shut that pod down Correct. So in some ways, but we can require testing. Yes, exactly. So um, going on to, to social events, how's this? If you're having a party and you know everyone has been vaccinated, 
can we say that at your risk of getting your risk of getting sick or getting someone else sick um, is the same as it might have been if somebody came and had the flu? You know. Yeah. That, so, yeah. So again, it's a great question, and you know, look, if everybody's been vaccinated, clearly the risk is incredibly minimized, right? And at that point, one has to balance the benefit. So in this particular scenario that you described, my personal recommendation and clinical advice would be, if you're going to a party, wear a mask when you're not eating. And then when you sit down to eat, you can remove your mask and eat if everybody's been vaccinated. But the goal, again, I want to emphasize is to minimize that risk. That's what this is all about. Um, and so for right now, masks are going to be with us, at least for the next year. And I know they're not comfortable, but they are important and they're effective. And I just want to give the perfect example of that just to impress upon people. As you know, it's January. Typically, we declare flu season in New York City sometime early December. We still haven't declared flu season yet. Do you know why? Because there's no flu. I know, Pete, that's what they flu, say. Because yeah. everyone's wearing a mask. So masks work. And so from my perspective, it's about minimizing risk. And that's a judgment that people are going to have to take amongst their families when they go out socially, but they just need to make sure they understand that calculation and then make the best decision that they feel comfortable with. Thank you. Thank you. It's like going to Asia. They wear masks. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Andrew, I skipped one and I was just reminded, do you uh -huh. have an idea when the AstraZeneca and J&J &J vaccines may be coming? Yeah. Sorry, so the, Ian. Yeah. So the latest projections uh, for the Johnson & Johnson Janssen product uh, is that they're in the process of looking at some of their data uh, to be able to see if it's ready to present uh, FDA. Originally, they were supposed to be presenting next week. Uh, my understanding is that they're delayed a few weeks. And so best case scenario, probably sometime mid to late February, uh, they'll share that data and they'll submit it uh, to the FDA for emergency use authorization. AstraZeneca, as you know, has already been approved overseas. Yeah. It's actually on the docket uh, to be approved here in the US. However, when we looked at the data, and I'm more familiar with this because I'm involved in one of the studies here in New York City, uh, when we looked at the data here in the state, we recognized that there were not enough uh, minority populations represented uh, in that particular data set. So we actually extended enrollment of our study actually through the first week in January. So we'll need at least another month or so to be able to follow individuals out. Uh, and then they'll start to call that data and look at it. So it most likely best case scenario, probably sometime in March, they'll be prepared to submit that information uh, to the FDA. So there are a couple of, of um, thank you for that. And uh, a couple of random questions. So I wanna go around and get some of these. We have a few more minutes. Um, here's one that shows up all the time and I'm not sure there's a, an answer to this. But it's um, why are some healthcare staff reluctant to be vaccinated? Yeah, so I, you know it's a great question and something that we're really puzzled with uh, where I work. And, and so, by way of example, we estimate that about thirty percent of our staff are vaccine hesitant. And when we started to interview inter individuals to get to the reason why, we often see that particularly in individuals uh, who are of color there is still great mistrust, unfortunately, um, of the medical uh, institution. We know, unfortunately, that there is uh, a long-standing history of medical racism that is very real. And so that fear is equally real. Added on top of that, there's also been a lot of mistrust of our leadership at the federal level in Washington during the pandemic. Yep. Many people don't understand the timetable and how quickly these were developed. Um, and so people have real concern. And I will just kind of say this out loud as a reminder, those of us in healthcare, we're still people. <laughs> and we have the same fears and anxieties as everybody else. Uh, and they're all different types you know, that make up those in the healthcare industry. But what I will tell you in looking at the data, doctors at my hospital, 99% of them have been vaccinated high percentage. Nurses, not so much, probably about 60%. And then it drops even further when you start to look at support staff and specifically the environmental services uh, individuals. And that to me, quite honestly, is what hurts me the most uh, because they, in many ways, 
represent communities, at least at my institution, that have suffered the most from the pandemic. And they are putting themselves at risk every day by working side by side with us, you know, making sure those rooms are cleaned uh, and that the hallways are taken care of. Um, and so it is really our goal to educate folks um, to the safety, what we call Vax Champs. Uh, we are, have a very large presence on social media to kind of get that word out. I made a, si a silly video, at least <laughs> I thought was silly after I got my vaccine. And I'll tell you, Shirley, three different staff members from my hospital emailed me afterward saying they saw the video and they decided because of that to get vaccinated. And so that's what it takes is getting that word out, showing it's safe, talking to people, answering their questions. Well done, Andrew. I have a few little questions here, but that is a great story. And we've heard that. Um, once you get uh, your both doses, mm -hmm. how long does the immunity, when are you, at your greatest immunity, how long does it last? When can you go visit an elderly relative? So you get the vaccine, what next? Shirley, you're really putting me in a tight position because my parents are on the phone. So now you're <laughs> not gonna be allowed to visit them. All right, uh, in all seriousness, uh, after you receive your second dose, it takes about two weeks for you to develop full immunity. So two weeks after the second dose. As far as how long does that immunity last, that's a really excellent question. And quite honestly, we don't know yet. So we'll be continuing to follow this over the course uh, of the current year and see if people are going to require a second dose, or excuse me, or a booster uh, you know, thereafter. But for right now, two weeks after your second dose, you're fully immune. Got it. So we're just about at the end. There's a, a question here. Can we share a video of this session on Facebook? Can we share this? Are, are you comfortable? Sure, share? absolutely. Okay. absolutely. Um, you are a wonderful spokesperson for this. Andrew. <laughs> I mean, this has been amazing. I, I know I say that for everybody. I can see the Thank faces. Can, um, can I ask one question that somebody didn't ask that I thought mm -hmm. for sure would come up? Yep. And that's the question about um, serologic or antibody testing, right? So if you remember to that yes. very Slide that I showed is the third type of test. So many of my patients are asking me, Dr. Wallach, after I get vaccinated, should I take an antibody test to show that I'm immune? And so it's a really good question. And the answer is, of course, like everything in medicine, it depends. Uh, and it depends because it depends on the type of antibody test you do. There are different antibody tests. And so some of them are against the spike protein. And if they are, then if you take that antibody test, it'll show that you're immune. But other antibody tests are other different components of the virus and they will not come back positive. So the answer to that question is there is no indication for folks after they get vaccinated to get a confirmation antibody test uh, to prove that they have immunity. We know from the clinical trials that they work uh, and there is no indication to repeat. I just wanted to have that Got chance it. to say that out loud. And I guess that somebody wants to know, um, will we ever return to normal? I think you- um, I, It's a new normal. That. It's gonna it's, be a new normal. It's a new normal. Yeah. And um, if I, there, what I'm seeing in the questions, what I'm seeing in the questions is there are multiple variations on the same question, Andrew. If I have the vaccine and the kids had COVID, if you know, you know, when is it safe? And everybody wants a safe bubble. And I think what you're saying, I'm going to say it in my words. Okay. Then you say it in yours. You know, for a good year, even if you know whatever combinations you have, you've got to follow those four core principles. That's correct. Absolutely. So you know, and if awesome. you want to go, go ahead. Now, I was going to say, we'll all sleep better when we're vaccinated, right? Um, but still, to protect your loved ones, the core four are very reasonable, right? But you will be able to see your grandchildren. You will be able to go out. You will be able to have dinner. Um, but again, you know, I live in New York City. We're not going to get back to the days when, you know, Lizzie and Bill know this very well in the West Village and those very small restaurants where you're on top of one another. That's gone. And that's going to be our new normal. Right. And the theaters will have to take half the seats out because you can't right. sit on top of everybody. Yep. If we can get back there, that's what it'll look like. It'll look yep. different. Yep. 
So I think that you have been an incredible gift to us. I want to thank my friend Liza. Yeah. And, and of John, course, can John, Bill. Can John put up the my slides again? I want to show oh, that. Oh, yes. The, John, there's a special slide there. Would you please put it up? You know which one. Thanks. Right next to the, after that. One more. Keep going. There and there it is. <laughs> <laughs> So I just, for those of you who don't know my sister-in-law, she is a force to be reckoned with. And I don't know anybody who's ever been able to say no uh, to Lizy. So if you enjoyed tonight's presentation, you have her to thank. If you didn't enjoy it, I'm very sorry. But <laughs> <laughs> um, So as we end, as I always do, I just want to remind everybody, next uh, on Tuesday, on our next at Nourish, is Tuesday, February 9th. And we're picking up in the same spirit of what you're talking about. What we're talking about is food insecurity. There will be a film shown for two weeks that you can watch at Shomre, uh, through Shomre, uh, called Hungry to Learn. And then there will be a panel Tuesday, February 9th at Nourish, eight o'clock on food insecurity. So I invite you all to please join us for that as well. You'll get lots more information um, on that, but uh, that is our February date. So um, Andrew, Dr. Wallach, many, many thanks from all of us. Please stay healthy because we need you. you leading us. Thank you. And, um, and then I will see you all hopefully February 9th, stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for having me. Have a good night, stay safe. Bye. And there are many thank yous if you wanna look in the chat, everybody is applauding. <laughs>